Hey everyone, Jason here from spiritualbabies.net and we're joined again this week as we are every week in this series by Rod Bryant of Native.net. It is .net, isn't it? It is. There's yes. hardly any .nets and I'm always terrified. That, um, that's, it's... that's why I do .nets. Right. It's so unique. No one does it. So. <laughs> Um, and we are going to be your guides um, through this final episode of um, Fifty Shades to Get, in relation to the tour, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, maybe you can give us a rundown of what the the goal and aim is of of this set of programs. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we don't, as I've said many times, we, we're not pronouncing ourselves to be the experts about uh, anything in the tour, except what we have studied we pair it and transmit over to other people. And uh, it seems to be very effective, Jason, because we get a lot of comments, a lot of very good comments, and I've gotten a couple of good comments from uh, the rabbinical community that um, I think it cha it's challenging for them, you know, to hear these things coming from someone that is not a chacham or expert in Torah studies. But we're just here to illuminate some, f some studies that we have done on simple text. That's it. And the instructions that we're getting comes from Rabbi David Katz, Rabbi, uh, I mean, uh, Chaim Kolorfin. And so um, we're here to share those things about the gear, 50 Shades of Gear. The reason why we call that 50 Shades of Gear once again is because it's not um, uh, a single uh, one word, one definition concept. It has many different shades and nuances to it. And so we're here to try to, uh, to illuminate that. And because of that, I, I know we've um, we've done programs before where um, we'll get a comment or two afterwards where it says, but you said the gear is this, but I read that a gear is that. That's because the gear means different different things in different contexts. Precisely. And there are those, because of the confusion between the gear, they just dump the whole idea. It's like, ah, don't want to deal with any of it. And, uh, you know, here we're trying to have intellectual honesty and integrity to Scripture. And to say, look, it's uh, it's different. Di Gare means things different. Uh, means something different wherever you read it, but it's within context too. Words mean something in Hebrew, right? Right. So, um, I mean, um, personally, as a non-Jew, this is um, as much about me trying to find a definition for where I stand, as um, us trying to find a definition in the text of where the gear stands. <laughs> and right. Stands, he Absolutely. stands in lots of different places. <laughs> Right, look, uh, you wouldn't expect uh, a, a Jew who has lived a from life to even be interested, n barely even curious about a gear, because it just doesn't interest them, has no connection to them. And that's the reason why we are studying it. It's, we're, not, we're, trying, we're not trying to uh, define something that doesn't have a definition. We want to know what Hashem has to say about this concept. Okay, so we are in the last book. We're in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, and we are starting this week, I think, if your um, tallies measure up with mine, then we should be in um, 116. Mm -hmm. And Deuteronomy means words. This is the retelling. Moshe uh, retells during the 70 some odd days that he has left with the Jewish people. And this is just prior to entering into the land. He goes through and retells all of the Torah. And this is a very unique um, book because uh, oral Torah has its genesis from from this very book itself so the way we generally do this is we read through the words that appear in the passage in the same order as they appear in the Hebrew but we read the English for each word it sounds confusing it generally works out okay there are going to be some double ups in uh, this show where the same word ger turns up two or three times in the same passage so um, some of them will have different account different accounts and we'll talk about those as we get there so this is uh, Deuteronomy 116 and I charged your judges at that time at that saying here between the causes of your brothers and to judge righteously between every man and between his brother and between the stranger interestingly where um, the very last word there that says um, the stranger Usually, I have a very like, definitive G-E-R gear, but they've um, broken that down into um, Garo, um, which, and I think that's which, the first time I've seen that come up that way. Right, and this this is actually, uh, 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 what do you call it, a textual identifier that lets us know that there's something different about what, he's talk what they're talking about here. Uh, for sure, what we do know about this case is the 
stranger here is one who is part of the community and the judges that judge they're told don't treat the gear different than you would other people in the community you judge him right rightfully now the idea we mentioned this in, in numbers in the last uh, discussion that we had is the stranger that is attached to Israel to Torah to the knowledge of Hashem loves Hashem uh, loves the Torah the 613 they have a different status than a person who just lives in the land or has an association with Israel for example when we gave the illustration between uh, a, a, a Muslim living in Israel an I Israeli uh, Muslim and uh, a person like you who would move to Israel and live in a city and you would have a different status one status as a gear is uh, not as connected as the other and most definitely this is the person who is um, who is the stranger living in the land and they're instructing the judges don't differentiate between the two right Deal because, with them fairly because the strangers taken taken on all the laws he also has to be treated equally by those laws correct Correct. Very good. Deuteronomy 5:14. And the day, or uh, and the day of the seventh, is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Not to do or do not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your maidservant, manservant, ox, donkey, or nor anything, your livestock, your stranger, that is inside your gate, to the end that may rest your maidservant and your uh, manservant. Now. This uh, the Rashi would tend to say that there's a differentiation of the stranger that lives inside the gate versus one who lives outside of the gate. So this is this is one that could be a little fly in the ointment of someone who says that everybody, uh, all non-Jews, have to do Shabbos according to this text. Well, what we see is this indication according to Rashi that a person inside the gate is a person that's actually living inside of a, uh, a Jewish home, living with the Jewish community, and they are to not do any work at all, just like the rest of the family. Or if it's someone maybe living inside a Levitical city, maybe that's part of it. But if they're living on, in, the, in the countryside, in the hills, Judea somewhere, completely sort of detached from Jewish community, I don't see there being an obligation for them to not work on the Shabbos. And that's what we're talking about. That's where, once again, we have that separation between the gear that's obligated or has obligated themselves because of the Torah and then that person who's just merely associated by, by physicality. And we're going we're gonna to find, or we have found as we've gone through, that I think all instances where the gear is being part of a commandment, a call to action, it's explicitly said that sojourns with you or is within your gates correct it's never an uh, it's never a stranger that's separated in any way from the from the main people correct and and so uh, it doesn't mean that 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 the gear who is separated physically from jewish life uh but yet they believe in the torah the 613 commandments they're not prohibited from not working on Shabbos. Okay, we that's not what say what we're saying. We're saying they're not obligated if they don't live within the household, another Jewish household. Right. And so I think the next one is Deuteronomy 10, 18, 19. He does execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow and loves the stranger. So there's the first one. Ding ding ding. By giving him food and garments. And then we flip over to uh, 10 19. And love you therefore the stranger. And this is the second one, ding ding. For strangers, ding ding, were you in the land of Egypt? So this is about uh, loving um, your neighbor and looking right. after the fatherless, the, the the orphans, the widows, and the strangers within your community. Um, yeah, so uh, we're we're looking at a passage which is talking about how to treat the people in your community who uh, need a hand up and don't have uh, family or children to support them in their daily lives or friends because they're new to the community which is what the stranger would have been he wouldn't have had a family stru a family structure there a hierarchy to um, help them out and uh, so the three instances in this 
Um, the first two are relating to the stranger, and the third one is explaining that at one point Israel was that mm-hmm. different person in a different land. Now let's let's add another layer of thought to this. Uh, go to Deuteronomy ten seventeen, which would be the beginning of of the context, and. Uh, for people who are in the nations who do love Hashem, believe that there's only one God, and believes that there's a Torah uh, for the Jew, Hashem says, for the Lord your God, He is God, He's the God of gods, He's the King of kings, Lord of lords, great and mighty, terrible, that not uh, do, that does not regard persons nor takes reward, uh, He doesn't show favoritism, He, he, he does not execute judgment, of the fatherless and the widow he loves the stranger this is Hashem saying I love the stranger he loves you so it's good to be able to share that with a lot of people when they're watching this is remember that the creator of the universe loves you very much and he wants you to draw near to him someone actually asked me in the week um, via PM they said does um does God love the stranger or the Jew more I said God loves everyone Equally, he just says different purposes for different people. <laughs> right. That's that's uh, that's like saying, do you do you love your children over your cousins? Right. I mean. Okay, so uh, we skipped on now. Do you want to take this one? Uh, Deuteronomy fourteen twenty one. Do not eat anything that dies of itself. Uh, give it lager, lager. Give it to the uh, it to the stranger that is in your gate. You shall give that he may eat or you shall sell it to an alien uh, for uh, uh, you are a holy people you're the Lord your God uh, do not boil a young goat in the milk of its mother now this is one of these um, proof texts I guess that I would refer to if um, an Orthodox Jew would say no a gear is a convert period this is one of the proof texts I would go to and say, well, if that is the case, if that's the case, always a gear is a convert, then why would you give him trafe meat? There's, this is the proof text. So this is a different kind of, this kind of gear is not a convert. He is one who lives inside the gates. He, he does not work on Shabbos. Um, he, he is treated with the same level of legality when it comes to um, cities of refuge. Uh, but at the same time, he's not required to eat kosher meat. So that's, and when I say kosher meat, I'm not talking about pig. I'm talking about something that has not been butchered to the highest level of the law. And I, I, I think that what this also reflects is there's a kind of overlapping ripple effect of the Gare family within the community of Israel and the children of Israel in that you, there may be people within the gates who you can absolutely give the meat to and they can eat it who reside with Israel and rest on the Shabbat and do a lot of the other stuff but can absolutely eat the meat and there may be other families who have been with Israel through a number of generations who are now accepted as people who absolutely can't eat the meat right they've they've kind of involved themselves if right married in now they're accepted and that's probably you know that that's the other side of that that convert it label is. so you, you want to say conversion that's okay um they've um converted like a transformer converts <laughs> yes, <laughs> from from good. a guy who can eat the meat to an israelite who can't eat the meat Right. Um, and I and, think and that it could be within three generations, or it could be within the lifetime of that gear who says, "No, nah, I don't eat treif." Right. Okay. At the same time, if you if if a Jew knew that a gear does not eat treif and tries to push the meat off on him, that would uh, almost be tantamount to causing that gear to stumble. Okay. So um, it's a, it's a very I think it's a super important verse there because it does it. It's a oh, yeah. it's a clear line between what we're sometimes told. And uh, what the text really does say. Right, right. Okay, so um, we are now on fourteen twenty nine, and shall come the Levite because he has no uh, to part nor inheritance. That you and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow are inside your gates, and shall eat and be satisfied to the end. That may bless 
at the Lord your God in all the work of your hands that you do. That's uh, not so easy to understand in that way, but I'm going to read that through in a little bit easier English. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your town so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless and the widows who live in your towns may come to eat and be satisfied so that the Lord your God may bless you with all the work of your hands. So what it seems like to me is that this um, tithe is there to help the Levites who, who don't have um, land to grow storage grain on. You know, right. they, they can't plan ahead. Right. They're, they're totally reliant on the people. The foreigners who don't have any um, inheritance of land the right. fatherless who um, don't have any parents to feed them and the widows who don't have a husband um, to help look after them, they right. still get to eat. I think that's what Right, and so the Levites who are responsible for the distribution of, of charity, uh, this is the reason why tithe was so important at the time, is it was to take care of the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, etc. Very good point. Uh, wait, I think we've got uh, uh, 1611 and sixteen. 14. Okay, yes, yes, 16, 11, and 14. So I'll take 11 here. It says, And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son, your daughter, and your manservant, maidservant, and the Levite inside your gate, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow among or in the place that is chosen the Lord your God to establish a name there. So what is this in reference to? Um, I would, let's go back into context. It says, You shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering of your hand that you shall give according to uh, as, as you've been blessed and to the Lord your God. Now, in the context of this, how is the stranger, the maidservant, uh, Levi, at what level are they obligated on the feast of weeks that is listed here? There is a, a wonderful Talmudic um, uh, explanation to to who is obligated to the three main um, feast or three main uh, celebrations that every Jewish male had to attend. And there is um, a dialogue that goes on and says, look, this is, this is the bottom line. Um, these are the men that are obligated. If, you, uh, if you're not crippled, if you're not mentally disabled to where you can't travel and somebody has to look after you, now, it doesn't mean that you are prohibited. It just means that you're not obligated. If you're a child, male child, below the age of bar mitzvah, and if you're a male child above the age of bar mitzvah, then that father, if, if that child is uh, crippled or has a difficult time walking a long time and standing, then he's not, uh, he's, he's not obligated to go. Then it talks about... Um, an elderly person, if the man is too elderly to make the trip, he's not obligated to go. But it's interesting that at the end of that dialogue it says that all of these people are not obligated to go, but all, including, and this is where we get this text from, Deuteronomy 16, 11, all people are obligated to, what's the key word here? And you shall rejoice, have simcha, have joy before the Lord during this time. Now that's the obligation of every person in the world. So when Mashiach comes, the temple is rebuilt and people are going and bringing offerings. You may not be obligated as a stranger to bring an offering as say the male Jew, but you are obligated that during that time you have the utmost of joy and simcha and complete um, adulation that Hashem is doing something amazing in our midst. And we also are reminded when they were in exile that, the, the, that God spoke to the prophet and told them that they should rejoice in exile because of the temple. So here is the example of that, that the stranger most definitely, though he may not be obligated to attend on the three times a year like all Jewish males, he is obligated to have joy uh, and to rejoice in the Lord. I love that it reads that um, if you are physically able, you're absolutely invited to the party. I think that's right. lovely. <laughs> yes, and if, you, if you're not physically able, then Hashem shows his, his loving kindness and mercy towards you. 
and 1614 is yours right yeah and you shall rejoice in your feast you and your son and your daughter and your man seven your maid seven and levi and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are inside your gates i don't know how many times we're gonna have to say that but there it is there it is again and this is what so we've just talked about shavuot and this is um for the feast of tabernacles so there's two anyway, like I said, I think after we've finished the series, we're going to start going through the other areas in the Tanakh right. where the guys mentioned. There's at least two that if you're celebrating within um, with Jewish friends and family, whether that's in uh, real in the real world or um, like for a virtual window like Facebook, mm -hmm. you can do that without any worry or guilt or grief because you've been invited. Correct. You've been invited to have joy about uh, these these seasons and times. But once again, the ger that is only connected through uh, physicality, meaning the uh, the Muslim that lives in Israel, is not obligated to have simcha over these uh, particular celebrations and days. Twenty three seven. Right. It says, "Do not abhor the Edomite, for he is your brother." Do not abhor uh, an Egyptian because a stranger you were in the land. So a reminder that the reason why the, the ger is so important or the stranger is so important, that Israel, to include Avraham Avinu, was a ger. To remember that all of the ancestors that preceded the great patriarchs, they were ger. So... A call to remember where you came from. Yes, absolutely. Now, 2414. Uh, not do oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of your brothers or of strangers that are in your land, in your towns. So this is a call to see that uh, you're not to uh, take advantage of people because of their situation, and whether that be a family member, um, someone you know, or a stranger that you don't really have any obligation to. Right. Um, you to treat everyone equally, um, just as you hope to be treated. You know, it's it's interesting because um, for those who are in Christianity, who are come out of Christianity, one of the things that you're constantly instructed on is we have to love everybody, right? Now that that's not a bad, you know, a bad thing to say, but God says this is who you are to love. <laughs> this you're supposed to love your fellow, and you're supposed to love the stranger that is within your gates. You have that obligation. You need to do that. Treat them with respect. 2417, uh, you shall not pervert judgment of a stranger or of the fatherless, nor take garment of a widow. Once again, uh, this goes back to courts of law, and the obligation is to make sure that you judge equally amongst uh, all the people. Okay, so... Um this one is kind of a long one, um, 24, 19, 20, and 21. So it says, when you cut down your harvest in the field and you have, uh, have, have forgot a sheaf in the field, uh, do not go back again to get it. For the stranger, for the orphan and the widow shall it be. And it says, to the end that may bless the Lord your God in all the work of your hands. So the idea is here is Hashem wants to bless the Jewish people. And he says, this is how I'm going to bless you, by you giving part of your harvest. That is, the stuff that falls on the edge of your, of your of field. Don't harvest it. Leave it for the stranger and, and, the, and the fatherless, et cetera, et cetera. And in doing so, I, Hashem, want to bless you. And I'm going to, to do that through this method. It says, when you beat your olive tree not to go over the barrels again for the stranger and the orphan and the widow, it shall be so the idea was a stranger widow and orphan could actually go and and pick that harvest up off the ground and either eat it or resell it to make a living so there was a way for the the stranger or the orphan or the widow to actually have an income and Hashem says look I will bless you and not only that but I will give you increase of your harvest which is a pretty interesting idea that uh, this was more than just simple charity. This was actually uh, God's economy, Hashem's economy. And it's kind of like an investment because if you did it, you had to promise that um, yeah. it, would, it, it would bounce back. It would. I mean, it's a fantastic investment scheme. So uh, 
it, what do we call it, Hashem's pyramid scheme. It says here when you gather grapes, the same thing. Don't, uh, the grapes that, that are on the edges, leave them. Let, let, uh, let somebody else glean them from the, from the uh, vineyard or, or the vineyard, and, and that will be a blessing to you. So, fantastic. And anyone that's read through Ruth will have um, um, a better uh, mind of how that worked because there's, a, there's really great examples of Ruth going in and doing that herself. Well, look, look at the look at the 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 fruit of this. Uh, or sorry for the pun, but the fruit of this was that Ruth came and decided to become a gear and convert, become a real live gear. This is the harvest of, of someone who falls in love with Israel and their God because of the kindness of the people. Now we are in uh, twenty six eleven mm -hmm. and twelve and thirteen. And glad in all good that is given to uh, thing the Lord your God and all your house and the Levite and the stranger is among when you have finished a tithing all the tithes of your increase the year third which is the year of tithing and give it to the Levite to the stranger to the orphan to the widow that they may eat in your towns and be filled that you shall say before the Lord your God, I have brought away the hallowed things out of my house, and also I have given them to the Levite, to the stranger, to the father, and to the widow, according to your commands that you have commanded not to transgress your commandments, neither have I forgotten. I'm going to read that in context to make it a bit easier. When you have finished setting aside a tenth of all your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, to the foreigner, to the fatherless, and to the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. Then say the Lord your God, I have removed from my house the sacred portion, and have given it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all you, you commanded. I have not turned aside from your commandments, nor have I forgotten any of them. Um, what's kind of cool there is that we've already um, seen instance that the edges of the fields and of the crops were given to the stranger, but here we see that there was also an extra provision of the people giving a, their tithe right. to these um, four groups, but to specifically that the Gair is in there, mm -hmm. um, which I guess covered the... I mean, there must have been uh, people who were Gair in the community, living in the community, that were ill, super poor, crippled that couldn't go out and do some of the things like right. glean from the fields and I think this may be a, like a, a bridge gap to make sure that everyone was covered right I, I just find this amazing uh, uh, social um, what's the word for it safety net that is built into God's economy for, for Israel and they, they don't have heavy taxation on everything it is a personal responsibility of every Jew to make sure that they participate in this. And, you know, obviously not every stranger was destitute, but at the same time, if you came from Egypt, if you came from another country to live there in the land, you're starting off with nothing at all. And here is this idea of giving them a hand and helping to lift them up and get them into a place to where they can succeed. It's beautiful, beautiful verses, beautiful verses. 2719, here we go. Um, Cursed is one who perverts judgment of a stranger, fatherless, or the widow, and, and, and shall say all the people, Amen. Uh, once again, it's not only a commandment to not judge um, partially with a stranger, but it's, it's a curse. So you obviously are highly obligated to treat the gear, the person that's within the gates, with the same level of equal justice that you would have for a, a Jew. Right, and that swings both ways. So they're, mm -hmm. they're as guilty as anybody else for, for doing something wrong. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 2843. And the stranger that is inside, you shall get up above, above you very high, and you shall come down very low. This was the, uh, the, the, the punishment for um, Israel for not um, playing ball. And... and they were told that the the foreigner who resided with them would um, become more and more wealthy and become more and more prosperous, um, but the um, the children of Jacob um, would sink lower and lower until it mm -hmm. got to the point where 
the charity that was once something that they were given would they would be receiving and it says finally at the end there they will lend to you but you will not lend to them and they will be the head and you'll be the tail um and it's a series of curses it's not a very pleasant um no thing to read no it's put it this way if they fail to do this commandment the very important commandment that god had given then the roles would be reversed it would be the stranger who would be prospering and you would not be prospering and they would have to help you once once again though i mean we, we, this is not the first time we see this concept that when a jew fails uh and needs to do tshuva he's put outside the camp in the wilderness who's outside the camp my friend it's the gear mm -hmm. it's the stranger that's outside the camp so where does the jew go when he's been when he is um when he has sinned and refused or his needs to do tshuva he's sent outside the camp i do find it interesting that when uh israel the northern tribes were uh committing idolatry what did hashem do he pushed them outside of the land and they went to live with the gear uh, but it is the it is the day of mashiach in which uh, the Garim will begin to help push the Jew back into the camp and encouraging them to do tshuva. That's our job, is to, is to call the Jews to be better Jews. 29.11, it says, your little ones, your wives, uh, your wives, that your stranger in your camp, from the one who crops, chops of your wood and the drawer of water, He's going through uh, an explanation. It says in 29.10, it says, uh, You stand this day all before the Lord your God, all your captains and tribes and elders and officers and men of Israel. It means that this day that you will stand before Hashem and you will give an account to Him. And it's not just you, but it's the woodchopper and the stranger and your wives and the little children. Everybody stands before Hashem, even the person who draws water, which would indicate you know, the most lowly of, of household servants. The most important of the children of Israel and what people would conceive to be the least important um, people in the camp who weren't of the children of Israel but still lived with them. They're all equal when it comes to standing up in front of God. I, I, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, and when we talk about most important to least important, we're not talking about most important, least important in the eyes of the creator of the universe. It's, it's social status. A person who draws the water is not given the same social status as a Levite, for example. I mean, we understand that there is, uh, as we would call uh, in the United States and in Texas, a pecking order, right? It's, it's the way it works. Okay, and now we are in the final one. Together, the people, men and women and children, that your stranger is inside your gates. I want to say there's a there's a you all there. It's super important that we look at the the use and the yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To the and end. Your gate. What's your gate? That's exactly. Yeah, that's not the strangest that would gate. Be, uh, Rashi would indicate once again. It's the same word we saw before, but that's that is the person that is within your household, right? Inside your gates, to the end that they may hear, to the end that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to observe all the words. Uh, law of this. I'm gonna have to pull it up in a more uh, friendly form because it's just it's such a cracking thing. Right. I'm, this, is, this is a great text to end this this uh, discussion on because this is a fantastic text. So go ahead and pull up. Um, I think yeah, I think I'll go from nine. So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders. And sorry, yeah, and to all the elders of Israel, then Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, in the year for cancelling debts, during the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God and the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. I'm just going to say there, this is an orally transmitted commandment <laughs> system. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. <laughs> Henceforth, why the oral Torah is important. <laughs> Assembling the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God 
as long as you live in the land um, you are crossing the Jordan to possess that's fantastic so let's let's look at this these couple of words it says all the words of this law okay so there will be those who have taken this out of context and said see this is right here where everybody even the stranger is obligated to all of the 613 commandments it's not talking about all 613 it says the reason why they need to come and hear this particular law is to uh, cause them to fear Hashem and to observe this law and this very specific law you need to go back and look in the context of what that law is but the law having to do with um, um, re basically reestablishing the covenant that uh, the people had with God and their obligation to follow through with courts of justice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, last night, um, we, my wife and I, were traveling home, and a police car pulled a 180 in the middle of the street, lit up his sirens, and went speeding away. And I thought to myself, that's completely illegal. But he was a policeman. And policemen right. can do that. It's not illegal for them to do that, right? right? Now, there's one law in Ireland, but different people are subject to different laws depending on what they're doing, who they are, and the context that they live in. Absolutely. And so, th yeah, there's one, law f there's one law here that's being spoken about, even if you take it in a bigger context. Right. But dif I, 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 different I really people like are subject to different parts of it. Correct. I, I use, I've used this illustration for the longest time, um, we have more uh, traffic ordinances than there are commandments of Hashem. I mean, think about it. We have more traffic ordinances the driving down the road than commandments of Hashem. So first of all, uh, following the Torah commandments are not too hard for you. Uh, of course, Hashem even said that. But there's another part of that's really important. I live in the state of Texas. And according to the laws of the state of Texas, I am obligated, uh, I'm sorry, I am responsible for all of the laws in the state of Texas. However, I'm not obligated to every law in the state of Texas because, for example, uh, if I'm not a pharmacist, uh, there are laws that only apply to pharmacists. And this is where we, we be, what we've been trying to say is that just because I call myself a Texan and a law-abiding person, I am not obligated to all of the laws in the state of Texas. However, I cannot feign ignorance when I refuse to follow one particular part of the law that would apply to me. So, Very good. So that is it. We have reached the end of the five books. Okay. Uh, before we sign off, um, if, if you guys have enjoyed this and there are other um, aspects of um, kind of, I don't know, get a lifestyle. I mean, it's all very fluid at the moment. Yeah. But if you're interested in what we do and don't do, um, and you want to want us to talk about that, then let us know. So PMS. Right. Other than that, I think we may um, start approaching some other areas. What do you think in the text? Yeah, I, th I think it'd be a fantastic thing. Uh, I, I would like to leave it open to your audience to say, hey, why, why don't you guys discuss specific portions? That's fine. And then next, I really think that we ought to tackle some of the references in the Tanakh to people who are gear that most people would have not even thought for a second that this person is a gear. So people like uh, Ruth um, and Abraham and uh, um, Naaman and... Um, Correct. The, yes, yeah, and the, loads of them, aren't there? Wow. Yeah, there, there are. There are. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Right. I'm going to sign off. Thanks okay. um, very much for joining me um, on this series. It's been awful fun. And I have to say, um, I've probably learned more than anyone watching. So <laughs> that's Don't been completely worthwhile for me. We're able to share. We learn more. Uh, so uh, I want to um, thank you, Rod, for joining me. And I want to encourage everyone to go over to Rod's YouTube channel. He's got tons of really great programming over there uh, that you're going to really enjoy and get a kick out of. And it's good to sit down and study stuff. But then it's really good to listen to and um, do housework stuff too. So um, it fits right. both um, camps. Uh, and thank you guys for watching. If you've got comments, leave them underneath the video. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the channels. And we'll see you all again super soon.